Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning, and my apologies to my listeners for the extra day off I took this week to do some personal business. And uh, now we'll get back to the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Remember, we were discussing last time Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, a pope and an encyclical that is uh, regarded by some Roman Catholics as a, mis a papal mistake, uh, somewhat overstated, and that it is uh, somewhat ignored now in the Roman Catholic Church. And that is, so says the disinformed laity of the Roman Catholic Church. R. W. Thompson shows us just how significant and important and a keystone that this encyclical and syllabus are to the papacy. And the papacy is following the dictates of this and other papal encyclical letters denouncing republican and democratic forms of government, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, and all other Protestant institutions, even so far as condemning freedom of opinion. Yes, the thought police, the Vatican, the papacy. Now, if you're following along, uh, we're at the bottom, last paragraph, the bottom of the page, 203, if you're reading with me. We've been talking about this encyclical, and R.W. Thompson says, and here our analysis of this extraordinary encyclical letter of Pope Pius IX might end if it did not possess additional significance, which is concealed from the ordinary reader, whether Roman Catholic or Protestant. The hierarchy understand it perfectly well. If they were addressed by the Pope in Kabbalistic words, they would be furnished with a key to their interpretation. It is far better that an unreasonable space should be devoted to it than that what is hidden within should remain undisclosed and its true meaning unknown. So R.W. Thompson says, as I have alluded so many times in dealing with these encyclical letters, there are portions of each which are written in such a way that only the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church can understand. Only the adepts, the, the real hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church can understand, and the laity uh, just regarded as so, so much formality, so much mumbo-jumbo. And to our great error, Protestants don't try to analyze, but... R.W. Thompson does. He continues his analysis of this encyclical letter by going into these uh, this language which I call Pope speak. He goes into an analysis of the of the uh, the hidden meaning of of this encyclical. Now it's very powerful information. So I want my listeners to pay particular attention. And learn from this the lesson that I have learned, that papal encyclicals need to be studied, and they need to be uh, read in view of previous encyclical letters written by previous popes and held in context with those. And you'll find a consistency in among the popes that leave no room for doubt of what the papacy's intention is. And that is to rule the world and put down any, well, let's just put it plainly, any non-Catholic influence. And its anathemas and damnations are most heavily levied against Protestantism. Now, we're going to continue with this Kabbalistic uh, portion of this encyclical. R. W. Thompson says, it embodies, but without quoting 
several of the previous encyclical letters of Pope Pius IX. One in 1846, one in 1854, and another in 1862. In that of 1846, he denounces private judgment. That's right. Pope Pius IX denounces private judgment. We're not to use our own judgment. We're supposed to trust the Pope. We're supposed to trust the Church. Again, he says, in that of 1846, he denounces private judgment in the interpretation of the Scriptures and condemns those who, quote, dare rashly to interpret when God himself has appointed a, quote-unquote, living authority, that is, a Pope, to teach the true legitimate sense of his heavenly revelation, infallibly. Besides secret societies, he especially condemns Bible societies, which he calls, quote, these insidious Bible societies, unquote, because they translate the Bible, quote, against the holiest rules of the church into various vulgar tongues, unquote, thereby enabling it to be read by all the, uh, in all the spoken languages, and given to every man the opportunity to, quote, interpret the revelations of the Almighty according to his own private judgment, unquote, which God, in his opinion, never designed. So Pope Pius IX says that the Bible is not to be translated into any other language than that which the Roman Catholic Church translates it, that is, the Latin a dead language that nobody understands except the priesthood. You see how they jealously covet the Scriptures all to themselves? And they do this for the express purpose of isolating themselves as the only ones who can interpret the Scriptures. And that a Bible translated into the language of the common people, they say is a mishandling of the Scriptures. Uh, to, to subject the royal language of God to commonality, to reduce it to gutter talk. Okay? So says the papacy. But God's Word is to be translated. Look, on the day of Pentecost... When the gospel was going forth to the Gentile nations, God granted a gift. And I maintain that he temporarily un unloosed the tongues that were bound at the Tower of Babel when each nation was given its own language and people spoke in various tongues that they couldn't understand. That was a curse that God put upon those who were building the Tower of Babel. He confounded the languages so that they could not continue their work. Many miss the idea that God did it for their benefit. Well, on the day of Pentecost, when the gospel was going to uh, be proclaimed in all the Gentile nations of the world, God undid that curse. And the, and the gospel went forth in every language in Jerusalem. Now, did God make a mistake in translating or allowing those in Jerusalem that day and later periods to speak in foreign tongues, to, to as it were, translate the Scripture, to speak the gospel in the language of the common people? That's what the Roman Catholic Church insists, that the Bible should be translated only in the Latin and that it should be known only by the priests and only they can interpret them to the hearing of the people. Because if the people are allowed to translate the Scriptures into their own languages, then they just naturally will read it in their own language and use the brain and the that God gave them and the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit and comparing Scripture with Scripture 
to come to a different interpretation than the one that the Roman Catholic priests put on the Scriptures. And this is exactly what led to the Protestant Reformation. The Bible was translated into the language of the common people. People began to buy copies of it, even spending years' worth of, of, of wages in order to purchase a copy of it. They smuggled portions of the Scriptures written in their own language from town to town so people could read it. And they did under the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit, come to a much different interpretation than what the Roman Catholic Church or the priests of the Roman Catholic Church gave the Scriptures. And that led to a revelation that the papacy was that predicted in the Scriptures. The man of sin, the son of perdition. And they left the Roman Catholic Church in droves and there we have the Protestant Reformation. So when the papacy says that the Bible should not be translated into the language of the common people, you can view that as a direct attack upon Protestantism. Because it was Protestantism, the Protestantism, that arose because of the centuries of abuse of this wicked papacy the revelation from the Scriptures read in their own languages that they ought to come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. And they did come out. Now what we have are governments then established around the world under these pretenses that the Pope does not have any divine right to rule anybody, that he is the man of sin and the son of perdition, and that men ought not to be ruled by this so-called chair of Peter, and that men can form their own governments, governments of, by, and for the people who have the Scriptures as their guide. And that's what this, this entire book is about how the world had rebelled against the papacy and the machinations of the Vatican, the machinations of this man of sin, the son of perdition, the Pope of Rome, to reign in the kings of the earth, to reign them back in and to dominate and lord over the people. That Nicolaitan spirit that, do, that, that pre, predominated over the Middle Ages to restore that old world order today. That is what the new world order is, a restoration of the old world order. You're not to read the Bible in your own language. You're not to interpret the Scriptures. You're not to have your own opinion. You are to sit down and shut up and believe what the Roman Catholic hierarchy teaches. Now, this is what was hidden in that encyclical of Pope Pius IX. That's why it is so important for Protestants to read those encyclicals and understand what they, what they say and what they mean. Learn to read Pope speak. Okay, Pope Pius IX reaffirms the apostolic letter of Pope Gregory XVI. Now, you have to understand that there's a consistency, a continuity between popes and that when one app affirms something a previous pope said, then it's incumbent upon us to research what that previous pope said and what he meant and, 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 and view that in context of previous popes. So it's no small task, and this is why the Roman Catholic laity and so much of the Protestant world have no idea the importance of these encyclicals because they just don't take the time and are not motivated to, to, to understand this Pope speak and what's hidden in, this, in these encyclicals. He says he reaffirms the apostolic letter of Pope Gregory XVI, condemning these societies also, we're talking about Bible societies, and proceeds to a lament the, quote, most foul plague of books and pamphlets, unquote, with which the world is cursed. 
Now here, it, implicit in this, is the, uh, the papacy's condemnation of freedom of the press. Okay, Bible societies and 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 uh, an out of control press that teaches things contrary to the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It says that these these foul this foul plague of books and pamphlets unquote with which the world is cursed. And it says from quote unbridled license of thinking, speaking, and writing unquote. He declares many bad consequences have ensued. Among others, the diminution of his own power, opposition to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, and the melt away of the influence of all power, that is, of all royal power, which is, which is alone legitimate. This pope says that only the royal power is legitimate. Now, what is the royal power? Well, obviously, the Pope considers that he is the divine right ruler of the kings of the earth. And those kings which he crowns share that divinity, that divine right to rule. Okay, they are the royal power. Okay, in, in modern day language, in Alex Jones language, <laughs> they're called the rich ruling elite which sheds absolutely no light upon who these people really are. We here at Inquisition Update put a name and a face on the rich ruling elite, this royal power. It's the Pope and the kings of the earth. Now, he enjoins due obedience to princes and powers, except in cases where, quote, the thing commanded be opposed to the laws of God and of the church, unquote, in which event this obedience is not due. Now, where does that put the Pope? First of all, the laws of God belong to the Pope. That is, according to the Pope. He is the one who interprets God's law. And we're to be obedient to our princes, that is, our kings, so long as what they command is true to the laws of the Pope and of the Roman Catholic Church. See, you have to understand Pope speak. And it says he counsels the Roman Catholic princes, that is, the kings of the earth, to remember that, quote, the regal power was given them not only for the government of the world, but especially for the defense of the church, the Roman Catholic Church. Wherefore, he beseeches them, quote, to defend the liberty and prosperity of the church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, in order that the right hand of the church may defend their empires, unquote. That is, that each may maintain the power and authority of the other and thus subject the whole world to their united government with the state, however, obedient to the church and the church obedient to the pope. Okay? You, do you see the, the power structure here? The organizational chart? According to the pope, you have the pope at the top and directly beneath him, you have all the kings of the earth. And beneath them, you have the people. Now, the Pope represents the church and the state, since he has the two keys, both the spiritual and the temporal. The temporal applies to the kings of the earth, and the kings of the earth apply that temporal sword to the people. And likewise, the Pope has the keys to the spiritual power. He is the head of the spiritual power. He's in charge of the Roman Catholic Church and the, Rom or the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the priests, and the priests are in charge of the spiritual affairs of the people. Top-down government, spiritual and temporal. In other words, the Pope is all in all. The ultimate authority in the world and that the world is to be a united church and state. 
the kings are to obey the Pope, and the people are to obey the kings. Therefore, the Pope rules everybody, the kings and the people, in both spirituals and temporals. And, the, and R. W. Tops continues, he says, Thus we have one key to the encyclical of December 8, 1864. But still within this there is another, that is, the apostolic letter of Pope Gregory the Sixteenth. He issued two pontifical bulls, one in 1832 and another in 1844, reaffirming what had been said of Bible societies by Pope Pius VII in 1816, by Leo XII in 1824, and by Pius VIII in 1829. This is what Gregory the Sixteenth says in his bull of 1844. Quote, We confirm and renew the decrees recited above, delivered in former times by apostolic authority, that is, apostolic letters from a pope, against the publication, distribution, reading, and possession of the books of the Holy Scriptures translated into the vulgar tongue. Unquote. And this quote was taken from Dowling's History of Romanism, page 623, if you would like to look it up. That's what the Pope said. He condemned the publication, distribution, reading, and possession of the Scriptures translated into the vulgar tongue. Now, this was reiterated by five previous popes. Now, when a Roman Catholic tells me, well, we don't really take Pope Pius IX's encyclical very seriously anymore, I have to ask you, when you do that, do you just wipe away the previous five popes in succession and what they said too? I'm afraid if you had this discussion with your Roman Catholic hierarchy, he would tell you, now, wait a minute. We can't just dismiss Pope Pius IX that way. After all, he was an infallible pope, and he restated or reiterated and redoubled what his predecessors had to say, and they were infallible as well. I think it more important that we read and understand these encyclicals and understand that this is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, and this is what the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy believe and it really doesn't matter much what the laity believes as long as the hierarchs know what's going on what the plan of the papacy is after all they rule over the people in spirituals the priests are the brain trust of the Roman Catholic Church and they don't tell the laity everything now Continuing, it says, this, it'll be noticed, is not an inhibition, uh, an inhibition against a false translation of the Bible, but against any translation into the vulgar tongue, as they say. That is, into the spoken language of any people. To the papist, his were the utterances of infallibility, as binding upon him as if God himself had spoken them. And therefore, the church itself, in attempting to escape the censures of the present age by translating the scriptures into the vulgar tongue, has disobeyed this prohibitory injunction of its own pope. The papacy claims to be the single authority over God's word, and he doesn't want it read by the people. That is the history of the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church never changes. Now... Pope Pius IX reiterated what Pope Gregory XVI and five other popes in succession uh, condemning the translation of the scriptures into the vulgar tongue. And it, this, it will be noticed, was not an inhibition against a false translation of the Bible, but against any translation into the vulgar tongue, that is, into any of the spoken languages of any people. 
to the papist, his were the utterances of, of infallibility, as binding upon him as if God himself had spoken them. And therefore, the church itself, in attempting to escape the censures of the present age by translating the scriptures into the vulgar tongue, has disobeyed this prohibitory injunction of its own pope. But as this was the only answer to a, a demand made necessary by the increasing intelligence of the world, and to resist the encroachments made upon the papacy by the open Bible, uh, uh, by the open Bible of Protestantism, obedience is so far paid to that part of the injunction which prohibits quote the publication, distribution, reading, and possessions of the and, and possession of the books of the Holy Scriptures, that there are millions of Roman Catholics in Europe, in Mexico, and in South American states who are not allowed to possess a Bible, and thousands in the United States who know of its contents only what their priests choose to communicate. So there's the effect of this encyclical. That in the Roman Catholic states in the world, South America, the Baltic states, people have never seen a Bible. They're prohibited to have one. They're prohibited to re of reading it. And there, it can be rightly said that in the United States, Roman Catholics only know of the Scriptures what their priests have told them about them. Anyone who investigates this will find that free study of the Scriptures is practiced only to the degree that Protestantism demands it. Let me see if I can phrase that another way. Roman Catholic, now my Roman Catholic critic would write me and say, well, I get to study my Bible, I can study my Bible, but what he won't say is that I can only understand the Scriptures in the context of what my priest tells me about the Scriptures. A Roman Catholic in this country, the United States of America, being side by side with Protestants, a majority Protestant world, is subject to all kinds of criticisms by Protestants. Well, you don't read the Scriptures. You do err not knowing the Scriptures. And the Roman Catholic will, will reiterate, will respond, well, I know the Scriptures. I have the Bible right here but they're not allowed to read those scriptures without the oversight of their priests. They're not allowed to believe of the scriptures anything different than what their hierarchy, their Roman Catholic Church officially teaches. And at some point, it becomes apparent that the Bible is secondary or tertiary or even quaternary of importance to that of the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Whereas Protestants, supposedly as divided as they are, have free access to the Scriptures in their own language, are encouraged to read it for themselves, and to trust God to direct their paths so that they can compare, spirit, uh, compare Scripture with Scripture and come to the right understanding of what God says. Now, which do you prefer? Would you prefer unity forced upon you by the dictation of the priests and the official teaching of the church with the possibility of missing altogether the message of the gospel? Or would you rather have a little bit of contention here and there, and every individual Protestant becomes a reader and an expert on his given area of Scripture, so that the entire revelation of the Scriptures might be available to the entire body. I would rather have uni I would rather have unity in Christ 
than to have unity with the papacy. Now, the Roman Catholic Church denounces Protestantism as just so many permutations of error. That there's no unity in the Protestant churches because they're all allowed to have their own opinion. They're all allowed to read and interpret the scriptures for themselves. And that this very idea that there's so much division, so much denominationalism in the Protestant churches as an outward display of that error, outward evidence of that error. You have Baptists over here, you have Pentecostals over there, you have Lutherans over there, you have Methodists over there, and there's no unity. They all fight among themselves. They all disagree. But we Roman Catholics, we all agree. We all agree that what the priest tells us about the Scripture is true. Because what the priests tell us about the Scripture comes from the infallible chair of the Pope. And he's God's representative on earth. I'm telling you, it's a false unity. And as contentious as it can be between Protestant sects, I would rather have unity in Christ than unity in the Pope. Now, he continues, he says, But the bull of Gregory the Sixteenth of 1832, referred to and endorsed by Pope Pius IX, and now to be enforced by the faithful in the United States and elsewhere, so soon as the power to enforce it shall be acquired, besides its special condemnation of Bible societies, denounces and anathematizes liberty of conscience as a most pestiferous error, it is said, from which spring revolutions, corruption, contempt of sacred things, holy institutions and laws, and in one word, the pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state, unbridled liberty of opinion, unquote. That's right. Liberty of conscience is regarded by this Pope as a pestiferous error. And that the worst state to be dreaded in any nation is unbridled liberty of opinion. Now, we hear so much about thought police, but here it is in spades. This is the fountain of what is known as thought policing in the world. It's the papacy. And it says that also of 1844 is most expressive and suggestive, especially in its condemnation of religious liberty, which it denounces because it makes, quote, the people disobedient to their princes, unquote, and because if it should be conceded to the Italians of the papal states, they, quote, will naturally soon acquire political liberty, unquote, like the people of the United States, a result which the papacy will never tolerate, and to prevent which Pope Pius IX was always ready to turn the bayonets of his papal zouaves against his subjects until they fled before the artillery of Victor Emmanuel. Interesting, isn't it? One error leads to another you have liberty of conscience, then you have liberty of opinion, and then that pits you against your papally appointed prince, and then you have rebellion within the, within the nation, and bedlam, according to the Roman Catholic Church. That's the, the, the progress of reading the Scriptures in your own language. It upsets the entire apple cart. It turns into shambles, this government that the papacy is trying to impose upon the world. And that it has to be restored by force. And that's exactly what would have happened had not Victor Emmanuel liberated the Italian people. 
And here we see in uh, Pope Pius IX's encyclical an attempt to, to incite rebellion right here in the United States of America. Preaching to his Roman Catholic hierarchy and to the Roman Catholic people of this country that they are to obey the Pope and not the Constitution and the laws of this land. And I'm telling you, the future holds for this country what the popes would have done for the papal states had not Victor Emmanuel liberated them. Because I don't think there's going to be another Victor Emmanuel, not for the United States. I think we're going to see the boot heel of the papacy imposed upon the people by the government of this country. And that's precisely what R.W. Thompson foresaw in the future of the United States if it did not heed his warnings. Now he says, but this is not all that is secretly embodied in the encyclical. It has already been seen that it refers to and approves the bulls of Clement the Twelfth, Benedict the Fourteenth, Pope Pius the Seventh, and Leo the Twelfth. All these have to be understood in order to learn its full import. That's right. Charles, you can't just dismiss Pope Pius IX and his encyclical as insignificant and no longer held with the respect that it was when it was written. No, to do that, you have to likewise discard the teachings of Pope Clement XII, Benedict XIV, Pope Pius VII, and Leo XII. And it says, Clement XII was a most bitter and unrelenting enemy of all Republican and Democratic ideas. Thus speaks a Roman Catholic historian, quote, As soon as he was seated on the throne of the Apostle, like his predecessor, Benedict XIII, he declared himself to be an enemy of the Democratic ideas which were filtering through all classes of society, announced his pretensions to omnipotence, and set himself up as a pontiff of the Middle Ages, unquote. And by the way, that historian was a renowned uh, historian uh, that wrote the history of the popes. His name is Cormenin, and this quote was taken from volume 2, page 376, if you have that reference. Look it up for yourself. And it says, this same historian, Cormenin, <clears throat> alluding to the bull which he issued against the Freemasons, now approved by Pope Pius IX, says, quote, His Holiness prohibited his, uh, his subjects under pain of death from becoming affiliated with or from assisting at in any assembly of Freemasons or even from inducing anyone to enter the proscribed society, or only from, or only from rendering aid, succor, counsel, or a retreat to one of its members. He also enjoined on the faithful, under penalty of the most severe cor corporal punishment, to denounce those whom they suspect of being connected with them, and to reveal all they could, to, uh, all they could learn touching this heretical and seditious association. So, uh, uh, a, a, a complete condemnation of Freemasonry with the threat of death for anyone joining or giving aid to a Freemason. At this period of time, the papacy was visibly outspoken against Freemasonry. But I maintain, as I have before, that that was for public consumption and that Freemasonry had, by this time, had long been taken over by the Jesuit order and they were secretly using Freemasonry to promote the Vatican's New World Order in this country. And that's, what it, that's the purpose that it serves. Ultimately, Freemasonry serves the papacy. But we can't dare let 
people know that, so we have to have the Pope come out publicly against Freemasonry. You know, they call it plausible deniability in uh, modern parlance. Trust me, Freemasonry is a servant of Satan, just as is the papacy. The Jesuit order is in control of Freemasonry, and they are the movers and the shakers of politics in the world, international politics. And the direction is, is, is put forward by the Jesuit order, a one-world religion, a one-world government, and a one-world economic system. That's what it's all about. Now, the papacy condemns Freemasonry, but just keep it in mind that every time the papacy opens its mouth in opposition to Freemasonry, it's opening its mouth in opposition against one of the most valuable servants to the Jesuit order they ever had. So, take it with a grain of salt. Now, he continues, he says, Benedict the Fourteenth was the immediate successor of Clement the Twelfth. Although he professed opposition to the Jesuits, who were at that time held in almost universal execration, he at first secretly and afterwards openly aided them, he aided the Jesuits in arresting the intellectual progress of the people and in their opposition to the Enlightenment advocated and excited by the philosophers and encyclopedists of France under the lead of Rousseau, Montesquieu, D'Alembert, and others. Among other means of doing this, he renewed the bull of Clement XII against the Freemasons and other secret societies. Now, Freemasonry was blamed for the, uh, the French Revolution. <laughs> and as we know, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was a Freemason, 33rd degree, I'm told. And he was the one who went about Europe punishing the kings who upheld the suppression of the Jesuits. But they're still trying to maintain that the papacy uh, hates Freemasonry, when the Jesuits were simply using Freemasons to organize this revolution, this so-called revolution, uh, to impose the temporal sword on the kings of Europe who suppressed the Jesuits. So see the duplicity here. Don't miss the duplicity of Freemasonry. On the outside, on the surface, Freemasonry seems to be opposed to Roman Catholicism. They claim that they were once the, the Knights Templar who were suppressed by the papacy and that Freemasonry is really an organization organized to well, to punish the papacy, that it's anti-Roman Catholic. That's the general perception of Freemasonry, when in fact it serves the Vatican. You know, we all have to learn eventually that if you want to know the truth, don't go by what somebody says. Go by what they do. And if you watch what Freemasonry has done throughout the ages, you understand who they serve, despite what they say with their mouths. Now, Pope Pius VII was pope nearly as long as Pope Pius IX has been, from 1800 to 1823. His pontificate was chiefly distinguished by his excommunication of Napoleon Bonaparte and his subsequent recantation under the terror of threats when he called Napoleon his most dear son and by his restoration of the Jesuits to pontifical favor as the vigorous and experienced rowers, as we've stated earlier, to guide the papacy and save it from shipwreck and death. That's what Pope <clears throat> Pius VII said about the, the, uh, the, the Jesuits, that they were the vigorous and experienced rowers that would guide the papacy and save it from shipwreck and death and lead it to world domination. That's the purpose of the Jesuit order, and Freemasonry serves that purpose. So, Napoleon was working for the, 
for the Jesuits through Freemasonry, and this confirms it. <clears throat> now it says, but his condemnation of Bible societies, which Pope Pius IX has especially approved, is expressed in his encyclical letter of 1816 addressed to the primate of Poland in these words, quote, We have been truly shocked at this most crafty device, that is, speaking of Bible societies, by which the very foundations of religion are undermined. We have deliberated upon the measures proper to be ad adopted by our pontifical authority in order to remedy and abolish this quote-unquote, pestilence, as far as possible, this defilement of the faith so eminently dangerous to souls. It becomes Episcopal duty that you first of all expose the wickedness of this nefarious scheme. Don't forget, we're talking about Bible societies here. Those societies <clears throat> organized to translate the scriptures into the quote-unquote vulgar tongue so that the people can read it for themselves. He continues, he says, It is evident from experience that the holy scriptures, when circulated in the vulgar tongue, have, through the temerity of men, produced more harm than benefit. <laughs> I would like to ask, harm to whom? Harm to the papacy, harmed to the harm to the biblical antichrist. The papacy hates the scriptures more than anything. And that's why they want to keep it to themselves, wrap it in mystery, and dispense what they want people to know about it from the priests. You talk about the control of information, thought control. Control of speech, control of the press, control of your opinions, control of the Word of God. That's what the papacy has historically established. Never mind what they say in public. Look what they've done over history. It continues, warn the people untrusted of your care. Uh, excuse me. Warn the people entrusted to your care that they fall not into the snares prepared for their everlasting ruin, unquote. This pope instructs the priests of the Roman Catholic Church to protect their subjects from the snares of everlasting ruin that is achieved by these Bible societies that translate the Bible into the language of the people. That's the history of the papacy. Despite all the denials, that's the history of the papacy. Control of the scriptures. Now, Pope Leo XII succeeded Pope Pius VII, and Cormenon says, quote, He was not long in raising himself to the highest dignity, by means of his intrigues with the Roman courtesans and his liaisons with the bastards of the incestuous Pius VI. He promulgated the bull Quad Hec Hoc Enuento Seculo, which fixated a universal jubilee for the year 1825 in order to revive the trade in dispensations, indulgences, beneficences, and absolutions. And we'll get to that tomorrow on Inquisition Update. I hope Charles is listening. You've been listening to Inquisition Update. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.